order the uh, July 17th uh, meeting of the Trinity County Board of Supervisors. Judy, would you leave us in the pledge? Please join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, can everybody hear us with the new mics? It's all working. Yep. <laughs> all right, public comment. This time is for information from the public on matters not appearing on this agenda. All comments are limited to three minutes and must pertain to matters within the jurisdiction of this board. When addressing the board, please state your name for the record and address the board as a whole through the chair. No action or discussion will be conducted on matters not listed on the agenda. However, the chair may refer the subject matter to the appropriate department for follow-up or to schedule the matter on a subsequent board agenda. Okay, no public comment today. Uh, our first is uh, uh, presentations for a supervisor. Uh, Judy, you want to read the item and then introduce uh, the four service for us? Okay. Uh, board members and members of the public, uh, we're going to receive a presentation and an introduction from Shasta Trinity District Ranger Joe Smales and Scott Russell, the new Shasta Trinity Force Supervisor from the Trinity, um, sorry, Joe is from the Trinity River Management Unit with the U.S. Forest Service, just to be clear. So, gentlemen, welcome, and I see Ben is in the audience as well, who's been with us for quite a while. Um, please. Uh, you're welcome to come to the podium and give us a few bits of words of wisdom, updates. <laughs> sure, sure. Yes, my name is Joe Smales. I am the district ranger at uh, Trinity River Management Unit, Shasta Trinity National Forest. And I've been here since February of this year. I come from the Plumas National Forest as the timber management officer for about nine and a half years. I am very happy to be here. I feel like I'm living the dream. I'm uh, pretty excited about that. I uh, love working with people. Uh, my passion is forestry. I am a, a registered professional forester in the state of California. You will find a few district rangers that have the RPF license. Uh, a few, but not, not a whole lot. So maybe there's a trend going on here in the, in the Forest Service. But indeed, I am very happy to be here. And uh, I did live here in uh, Weaverville back in 1978. 79 was one of my first jobs uh, out, of, out of school. Graduated from Texas A&M uh, with a forestry degree. And uh, so forestry is indeed my background. So um, I'm excited to be here for the reasons of hoping to make a difference. And difference meaning that to treat the landscape. As we well know, the, uh, the landscape across Northern California <coughs> is overstocked anywhere from, I'll put a number on it, sometimes numbers uh, uh, get away from people, but you know, we're looking at 400 to 800 square feet basal area per acre. That's just, that's just really, really tight stocking where you almost have to stand sideways to get through a timber stand. And we have those here on the west side on the Shasta Trinity. So uh, uh, my goal is to create and find efficiencies um, in order to treat the ground. And so it's just not vegetation management here on the Shasta Trinity National Forest. We also have recreation and we have fire and I have responsibility over all those areas as the district ranger. So as I came here, I, I see that there is a lot of things that were done right and maybe some things that need some improvement. And so it's, uh, it's my desire, uh, again, is to look for those efficiencies to get the work done. Uh, sometimes government has the, um, has the view, uh, the public has the view towards the government of just going through process, process-oriented, process-oriented. And that's true. Sometimes we are process-oriented, make no mistake. But at some point in time, there needs to be something done. And uh, that's one of my goals is to is to get something done. With my background in timber and in private industry, I, I did work for Sierra Pacific Industries for about uh, five, six years. 
Um, I don't know if you know Tom Walls, but uh, he was one of my colleagues. I got hired Tom um, with Bud Tomaszewski back in, uh, I think it was 1981. So I have some uh, good backgrounds with people, and in, in timber, it's very much a black and white scenario. You either do it or you don't. And so hopefully, I, what I can bring to the table in this position, you, you're going to do it. Uh, if you can't do it, why? Um, and there's always um, uh, extenuating circumstances that would lead you to some delays, but I think a, a good, strong leader would find uh, a way to get something done through the process. And so that's, that's one of my goals, again, is to get through that process as efficiently as we can and show something uh, to the taxpayers that, hey, this is what we have produced. And so uh, projects, if I can talk a little bit about our projects, we have what we call indicator projects. An indicator project is a priority project. It's a vegetation management project, and um, I've established a priority uh, right from my arrival for the Burnt Ranch project. It's about a 2,500-acre project. Um, of course, it's on the west side, very far west side of our district. And uh, this is a project that has been going on in planning for about four or five years. Uh, I see some heads nodding. You've known that for a while. So uh, we, uh, we, we hope to have something in the order of a decision by next year. And the implementation, meaning logging and uh, some, uh, some burring, uh, some mastication, and some hand treatment, we all hope to get started within about a year, a year and a half. That's my desire. We will have a public field trip, uh, hopefully sometime in October, and we want to show what we're going to do. We want to be transparent in that way. Another project, uh, it's another indicator project, is the uh, Trinity Alps Prescribed Fire. That is a project in which we propose to burn, understory burn. Uh, it's about a 3,500-acre project. Um, we're meeting for the first time in a long time, the end, of, the end of July, and it's my desire that we have a decision on that as well. Uh, I, I say decision. We have to have a NEPA decision before we actually put boots on the ground or any implementation at all. We have to have a NEPA decision. And so we hope to have that within about a year as well. And uh, this is one of those projects that's uh, been on the books for a while, but it's my desire to get her going. Uh, the other project is the Petty John. It's a, uh, it's a, a veg project where there is uh, timber removal on that project, much like Burnt Ranch. And this project uh, we hope to get out um, hopefully next year. It is a project that's under litigation. And so we hope to get through that litigation. Our lawyers, uh, federal lawyers, are working with the plaintiffs and trying to find some resolutions. So we get those resolutions. It's, uh, it's my uh, desire and, uh, and hope that we get some uh, timber out of the woods hopefully next year. We'll see. Sometimes legal uh, uh, processes go through uh, certain time frames that we can't anticipate. Uh, another project that is not an indicator project, but it is important, it's uh, called Brown's Phase 3. So those who are familiar with the Weaverville Community Forest will know about this project. There is Brown's Phase 1, Phase 2, Phase 3, we're in Phase 3. And we will actually get a timber sell out before the fiscal year. Our fiscal year ends September 30th. And uh, I, I believe with confidence I can say we're going to have a project out it's going to be about 900,000 board feet. Um, we hope to sell that. It is a stewardship project, uh, meaning that we will have other value-added treatments other than just taking the timber out. Um, namely, we will probably um, have some timber, some of the smaller logs set on the landing for firewood use for residences or firewood users. So they choose to get some firewood, we will make it available on the landing. Um, but the good news is we're going to get some land treated, somewhere around 110, 115 acres. Um, it's a smaller project, but we, uh, we hope to build on that. We haven't had a, a timber sale on the unit for a while, um, I would say in about two years. So this is kind of exciting for me that we're going to get something out, out of the ground. And uh, I think success builds success, builds confidence with my own people and certainly to the public. We want to have the public 
have um, a degree or an increase in confidence in what we do. Um, it's, it's my strategy to, um, to reach out to some of the partner agencies. Um, I have met Keith, I've met Judy, uh, John and, and Terry, I'd still like to spend some time with you. I certainly invite you to come to my office across the street uh, if you have the time. Uh, if you can't, I will probably come knocking on your door and saying, hey, what's going on? What are the uh, important issues here in Trinity County? Uh, something maybe that I can relate to and help with, I would certainly like to know. Uh, met a little bit with the CHP uh, and some of the uh, community fire folks. I will continue to do that. I believe that if, if there is a familiarity and there's a connection, when those instances come up, those um, maybe fire instances, if you will, uh, there's a little more sense of confidence uh, between the agencies. I think that's, there needs to be some improvement in that, to be frank with you. And so I will certainly do that. But again, I extend that to you too, as well, uh, Board of Supervisors. So um, there's other issues um, that um, I'm dealing with that have been put on my plate uh, since my arrival. And uh, I'm not afraid to take on challenges. I, sometimes I think they're, they're intriguing. Um, uh, sometimes they're a little bit hard. But you know, this is a district ranger position, and, and uh, you take it all. And I, I'm gaining confidence with the people that work for me uh, across the street. Uh, there's some good specialists that work uh, very uh, profound in their talents and what they produce. Um, sometimes government doesn't have uh, a real window for the public to see what they do, but um, perhaps uh, we can increase that transparency to show what they do. So um, anyway, that's I don't want to take too much time, but uh, if there's any questions that you may have for me, I would certainly entertain that. I, I do have a question. Um, of course, water right now in California is pretty serious. Uh, everybody's looking for where to find more water. Right Now, when you talk about the heavy overstocking, uh, have, have you done any analysis or on, the, on the district uh, about the overstocking and the impact on how many hundreds of thousands of acre feet or uh, that the extra stocking transport trans yeah right the transportation of, right. of moisture right. into the year right uh, evapotranspiration that was where I was trying to get um, I'm sure there is uh, the carbon sequestration issue is is very strong in the state of California um, and I think there have been studies I, I don't know if if we have um, um, an incredible amount of information. I think we're still learning uh, about that, not just sequestration, but how much stocking does um, transport all that moisture. That certainly is uh, a factor, uh, can be a factor in what we do. Uh, I haven't seen any, any data, Keith, mm -hmm. lately pertaining to that, but having said that, I think the biggest factor of overstocking is, is the sheer potential for catastrophic fire. That's what I really see. And uh, not to diminish the, the fact that it does, uh, it is a factor certainly uh, as far as evaporative transpiration of water, available moisture, that is a factor. But the, the, the biggest thing that I think is a threat to our livelihood and uh, our well-being here in this county, anywhere in Northern California, is that threat of catastrophic fire. It's not a matter of of uh, if it's going to burn, it's just a matter of when. So that's why we're trying to get ahead of that. That's one of the strategies. Get in front of the ball. Don't manage the fire. Sometimes we manage fire in our suppression activities. Um, sometimes that's a controversial issue, but uh, we do look for those opportunities. But we want to get ahead of that. We want to be able to treat that mechanically. Okay. No more questions. Thank you. No, great update. Thank you very much. Very Jim. good. Mm -hmm. Very good. Look forward to. Uh, spending time with all of you. Thank you very much. Good morning. Um, I'm Scott Russell. I'm the new forest supervisor on the Shasta Trinity National Forest. And so thank you for the opportunity to come by and say hi. I thought I'd piggyback on Joe's presentation. I won't take much of your time, but just wanted to come and say hi and, and introduce myself. Looking forward to, to working with you on all the activities on the National Forest. 
And, and so I'll just take a couple of minutes to talk a little bit about what I think is important. And I'll start with the idea that it takes all of us working together to be successful, particularly the levels of government working well together. And, and so as an agency, we're looking to uh, in, increase people's engagement in the management of their national forests. Uh, and a really important way to do that is through the counties and through the uh, uh, elected officials. And so look forward to working with you on many issues. Uh, as I say, it takes all of us. Uh, one example I'd like to point out there is uh, the, the success we've had in this area with the local area advisors in our fire program. Um, we're looking to continue that and to strengthen that program as a way for, for local people to be involved and provide their expertise and their um, experience in, in the management and suppression of fires. And so that's a topic that we'll, we'll, we'll want to continue to engage with you on as you sponsor those local area advisors. Um, you know, as Joe talked about, uh, our landscapes are not resilient. Um, everything flows from a restored forest. Water, watershed, wildlife, recreation, community protection, and uh, fire behavior that is more um, similar to what it behaved like before we were all here in terms of low intensity fires. And, and so uh, for us, looking at how we get better and, and operate at a landscape scale in terms of restoring a forest is uh, really important for the national forest across the West, but certainly for the Shasta Trinity. So we look forward to working with everybody on that. It's important that we all get to a point where we see that all of the things that we desire from the national forest come from a landscape that's resilient. But. Uh, Look forward to working with you. Um, thanks for having me here. And uh, um, any, anytime you want to get in touch, I'll, I'll provide some cards to the clerk. Uh, and, and then we'll uh, obviously Joe's here in town and, and work with him. But uh, um, look forward to building our relationship. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Scott, again. Thank you guys for a brief update. <laughs> okay. We're going to move on to uh, receive a presentation from Dan's. Spice, Spice, uh, Chief Executive Officer and Medical Director, Dr. Eric Redrick of Northern California EMS regarding service provided to Trinity County. Thank you. Uh, I'm Dan Spies uh, with uh, NorCal EMS, and I'm here with uh, Dr. Eric Rednick, uh, our medical director. Um, thank you for the time on your uh, agenda this morning. I appreciate it. Last time we were here, we reviewed uh, some of the services that we provide Trinity County under contract, and we thought it would be good to come back and uh, make a similar presentation and talk a little bit about uh, some of the new things uh, that we're doing uh, as well. NorCal has served as your local emergency medical services agency since 1982. And uh, even prior to that, uh, our predecessor agency worked with counties in Northern California to bring in equipment and training to improve pre-hospital emergency medical care. And at that time, it was under a, uh, under a federal uh, project. But um, each county is uh, required to have a local EMS agency and the uh, uh, responsibilities are defined in the health and safety code. We certainly, uh, we currently serve as the local EMS agency for five counties, Trinity County and then Modoc, Lassen, Plumas and Sierra counties. Uh, we cover about 15,000 square miles with a population of only about 77,000 people in total in those uh, five counties. Each county is required to uh, have a local uh, EMS agency and that came about uh, from legislation uh, that was passed in 1982. In the larger counties, the more populated, the more metropolitan counties, it usually rests within the Department of Health, but many of the uh, less populated counties have banded together to either form a joint powers agency to take on this responsibility collectively, or they contract with uh, another county to take on that responsibility, or you can contract with uh, uh, another agency, and that's what Trinity County uh, has done. 
we are guided by a board of directors of nine directors. There's one supervisor representative from each of the five counties. We have an ambulance representative on our board, a hospital representative on our board, and two directors at large that cannot be either a supervisor or representative, an ambulance or a hospital representative. Trinity County's representative is Supervisor Chadwick, who also serves as our vice chair, and uh, the alternate is uh, Supervisor uh, Morris. Supervisor Morris attended our meeting uh, uh, last Thursday in Supervisor uh, uh, Chadwick's uh, absence. So what does an agency that's a local EMS agency do? And I try to describe it by following an individual who becomes certified or accredited and kind of track them through the system. But first, any uh, entity that wanted to provide either an emergency medical responder course, an EMT course, a paramedic course, or certain nurse training courses would come to us and we would look at their, their curriculum and the qualifications of uh, their instructors. And when we were satisfied that it met the intent and requirements of the regulations, then we would give that entity uh, a two-year um, uh, certification to provide uh, that training. Uh, an individual then that would successfully complete that training would come to us for either certification or accreditation depending upon what level uh, of uh, training they had undergone. Then when they wanted to utilize those skills, perhaps with a local volunteer fire department or for an ambulance service, we would have an agreement with that ambulance service that would spell out uh, the fact that they would uh, adhere to our policies and procedures, that they would adhere to uh, state regulation, and then we would have an agreement with them that was also signed by a hospital that would serve as their base hospital, which would provide immediate oversight for the care that they were being provided. So this agreement would have three signatures on it. Signature from our agency, the uh, fire department or ambulance service, and then a hospital signature uh, as well. So at that point, then we would develop patient treatment protocols and procedures, and Dr. Rennick can get into some of the detail on that here in a moment, but uh, it would define the skills that they would be using depending upon their certification or accreditation level, the medications that they could use and the dosages, the equipment that they could use and uh, the circumstances for using those pieces of equipment. So then at that point, we have training programs, we have individuals that have successfully completed the training, we have the provider agencies, which could be the fire department or the ambulance service that's connected with the, ambu uh, with the hospital. We would have patient treatment protocols and procedures, and then I always understate the fact that's the easy part. The, difficult part is making sure that everyone does what it is that they're supposed to do. And we have some 23 uh, pre-hospital agencies. We have seven hospitals. We have over 50 fire departments that are actively involved in providing care. And we have, I think, close to a thousand individuals that we've either certified or accredited. So when something goes a little bit sideways, and I use that term maybe a little loosely, then we can conduct an investigation and we might find out that it was just something that just happened to have happened and would probably never happen again. It may be something that there's an educational issue that is involved here. And we would sit down with the employer and with uh, that individual and perhaps write a performance improvement uh, a program for them to bring them back up to speed. And the objective here is to make sure, especially in the area that we serve, that individuals can stay in the game, so to speak, because the numbers of people that are out there that are willing to volunteer, that have taken the time on the weekends and during the week to take the training uh, is really very minimal. We would like to see those individuals stay and continue to provide service uh, to their community. However, we do have the ability, if need be, uh, to uh, uh, decertify an individual if the situation uh, calls for it. So in general, in a very general terms, uh, 
we monitor and regulate pre-hospital emergency care uh, on your behalf. Um, before Dr. Rednick comes up here, I want to want to uh, just point out that Dr. Rednick is one of 33 medical directors. There are 33 um, local EMS agencies in California. There's an Emergency Medical Directors Association of California. Dr. Rednick is very active with that organization. Within that organization, they have a scope of practice committee that takes a close look at uh, the skills that uh, the various levels would be using, the medications that, that they are using. Uh, he is that uh, agent, that uh, organization's representative to the State Emergency Medical Services Commission. And that commission is made up of individuals of physicians, hospital representatives, fire representatives, uh, the lay public, and every regulation that the EMS related regulation goes by the eyes of that commission. Um, uh, at the beginning of the year, uh, Dr. Rednick was uh, elected as the chair of the EMS Commission. And my point is that uh, for those of us who live in rural areas, we have a very strong voice uh, at, the state, uh, at the state level when it comes to uh, pre-hospital emergency medical care. So um, with that, uh, I'd like to just point out that the science of clinical emergency medical care continues to change just as the science of whatever our professional endeavor is and keeping up with the, the science uh, is an important uh, important uh, element of what we do as a local EMS agency. So I think Dr. Rennick has some information on some of the more clinical aspects of, uh, of our agency. You can turn the lights up so we don't put everybody to sleep. Good morning. For the record, my name is Dr. Eric Rudnick. Just to kind of bounce uh, and expand a little bit about what Mr. Spees said, I have sat on the scope of practice committee. This is my eighth year. Um, there are two of us. I was, for a long time, the only rural representative. I I find it ironic that somebody who was born and raised in the New York metropolitan area is a champion for rural Northern California. Uh, for those of you who don't know, who are involved in the state um, politics, I am tired of the L.A. tail wagging the rest of the dog. Um, so there are several of us now. Dr. Kimberly Freeman in, in from Tuolumne is another champion. Scope of practice is what decides what EMTs, paramedics, and MICNs can do. We are the voice, and we make the direct recommendation to the director, Dr. Howard Backer. Uh, this is my eighth year on the EMS Commission. Um, so, this is a very high level view of what's going on currently. So, allergic reaction, anaphylactic reactions. Uh, there's a recent article published by Blue Cross Blue Shield that the incidence has gone up about, oh, 150 percent, and this has actually become a public health issue. So for those of you who are aware or not aware, uh, epinephrine is in short supply, life-saving drug. Even worse is the auto-injectors that many people, EpiPens for the lay public, um, are in short supply. Even worse is that the manufacturers, not that they're greedy, maybe, uh, the prices, I have seen them go from about 35 to $50, and they're now somewhere between three and $600 an auto injector. So, um, what do we do? Because many of the rural fire departments, particularly in Trinity and the other counties we have, there's just so many bake sales and spaghetti feeds that you can have. Uh, $300 is a lot of money, $600 is even worse. So we've actually found a solution. Uh, recently there's legislation, and we're one of the first counties to do it, to do EPI safe kits. And so that's going to allow EMTs, and this is in, stat, this is in um, our policy already. And what that does is a very slick thing, initially studied by Seattle Kings County, they did a study 
and out of 2,000 um, administrations, there were no adverse effects. It's huge. Now, some people did die in the study, but that was not to be unexpected because anaphylaxis uh, and a severe allergic reaction, to say for a bee sting, it can be life-threatening. And so these people may or may not have gone on to die no matter what happened. So the cost difference is somewhere around three to four hundred dollars. Well, the Epi Safe Kit that has everything in it is twenty-eight bucks. Just a little bit of a difference. Now, up until recently, EMTs were not allowed to give intramuscular injections. They are now, and the Safe Kits are, as I put it, ER doctor proof. And so, when, hey, it's, it's true. When you draw up the medication, the syringes in these safe kits have two markings on them. A for adult, P for pediatric. So far, so good. So when you draw it up to the P mark, it's 0.15 ml. Well, that's the dose you give a pediatric patient who's having an anaphylactic reaction. The adult is 0.3 ml, again, for an adult. I think most ER doctors can figure it out, so therefore I think the pre-hospital personnel can handle it also. So another uh, remarkable thing is Benadryl, you know, for an allergic reaction. Up until recently, EMTs were not allowed to give it. Paramedics were not allowed to give it, not within state scope. So it got a little tiresome and embarrassing when the ambulance would have to stop at CVS on the way to the hospital and say, jump out, go buy your Benadryl, take some, and let's get going. So now we can, our paramedics and EMTs and above can give Benadryl, oral disintegrating tablets, elixir for pediatric patients, and regular pills. Now the paramedics still can give it IM, intramuscular injection, or IV, but this is huge. So um, next thing up on our hip parade is intranasal Narcan. So who of us haven't heard about the opioid crisis in the country? This has been on the books, and this goes all the way down to lifeguard now. We have the enabling protocol and policy. So fire, law are able to do that. That's up on the website. We provide the training, and we've had saves already. Uh, and this is tremendous. So next up is shortages of critical medications. We've been working at a state and national level. I uh, have a national footprint. I'm a member of the National Association of EMS Physicians. And the FDA is actually developing a task force. Uh, for example, I'm, I have several ambulance services down in the Central Valley, too. For example, Merced County has no morphine. None. Gone. Can't get it. So if you were unfortunate enough to break your leg, you can get a bullet to bite on. Fortunately, there are some alternatives, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So acetaminophen, also known as Tylenol. So recently, we put that into the scope. And we put it into the scope IV. You say IV Tylenol? Well, the studies show that it's as effective as opioids, morphine, fentanyl, for post-operative pain. So that probably will be in a local optional scope for the NorCal County, probably within the next six to eight months. And there's another medication called uh, Toradol. You can buy it over, you can get a prescription for it, it comes in oral, but it also comes in IM, IV, and most recently, intranasal for pediatric patients. How great is that? A kid falls down, breaks their arm, they don't have to get a shot or an IV start. Pretty amazing stuff. So there are now seven different medications that I anticipate our providers will be able to do within the next seven, eight months. And that's ketamine, fentanyl we already have, morphine we already have, IV Tylenol, oral Tylenol, oral Motrin, what is, you know, things you can buy over the counter, paramedics, EMTs, AEMTs have never been allowed to be given in, in the state. I don't say it necessarily makes sense, but that's the way the regulations were written in the 70s, designed to keep us in the 70s. 
I've talked a little bit about the commission, the scope of practice committee. So, um, for those of you who don't know, pediatric intubation, which is advanced airway technique for peds, uh, as of July 1st, went away. So, if you have a critically ill kid, what are you going to do? So, traditionally, they've done bag valve mask ventilation. So, you put the mask on, got the valve, bag going, and you're ventilating them. That doesn't work for an hour and a half transport or a 45 minute to an hour transport when Trinity County Life Support goes to Mercy. So, again, this is the <clears throat> larger metropolitan area such as LA, San Diego, Sacramento, San Francisco saying, hey, we got a 10 minute transport, what's the big deal? Well, they don't have hour, hour and a half, and STAR, which is on the western part of Trinity, they have even longer transports. So, we scope practice got something called the supraglottic airway into scope. And it is now active in NorCal. So if you need an advanced airway, you have something now. Further, it's now in the EMT optional scope. So with additional training, EMTs can put down this device. Something else that we've just put in is something called the quick trait. And I didn't bring any along, but it basically looks like a harpoon, a stainless steel harpoon. And it's a last ditch effort to save somebody's life who can't breathe because they have an airway obstruction. We did a little study at MDAC, the, National, uh, the, the State Directors Association, and what it's replacing is something called needle cricothyrotomy, where you take a needle, you find your soft spot right below the Adam's apple and insert it. It's a rather dramatic procedure. So we pooled our, all our cases, this was about five, six years ago. Out of all the cases, nobody survived. So we're hoping with the new device, it will be um, better outcomes. It is a larger device, and it doesn't require something called transtracheal jet ventilation, which has been shown not to work. And to get the device, it's probably about $400, $500 for the device to do the ventilation, let alone the needle. These are now maybe 70 80 bucks, and you can hook them up to a bag valve directly. Um, so we've talked about the IGO, and the last thing I want to talk about is Stop the Bleed. It's a national campaign put on by the American College of Surgeons and the CDC. Um, though who hasn't heard about all these active shooter or hostile events? There was the one in uh, Los Molinos where the sheriff's officer got shot. Rancho Tehama, Las Vegas, Pulse nightclub. I could go on. The landscape of EMS has really changed, and for the lay public. And so the goal of Stop the Bleed is to get <coughs> people educated on how to stop the bleed using hemostatic agents, using tourniquets. Tourniquets have had a bad reputation, unfounded. And so we've already started last year and the year before, Mark Belden, who's one of our contractors, and I have gone out and taught how to apply tourniquets. I did that yesterday at Shasta College. I'm their medical director also. And who hasn't heard about the Boston bombing, the marathon? Yummy tourniquets they had commercially available. At that point, they had about five. The majority of the tourniquets used were all improvised. So the goal of Stop the Bleed is to get the lay public to know how to control bleeding. Further, the goal is to have a Stop the Bleed box next to every AED in the country. That's the ultimate goal. It's rather ambitious. I teach the class. And I think it's a very worthy uh, cause. It's part of the HPP or the Hospital Preparedness Grant this year. I'll stop for any questions, comments. Oh, great update. Thank you very much. Very Thank you very much. And I'm, you know, want to come back on a yearly basis to let you know what's happening. Um, we're pretty active. Thank you for your time. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Okay. <laughs>
We'll move on to item 1.3. We'll receive a presentation from Wendy West, Executive Director of the Northern Region of the Partnership Health Plan of California regarding Partnership Health Plan serving Trinity County, no fiscal impact. Good morning, Lady Corsa. Um, Health and Services. Unfortunately, Partnership is on their way here and they've been delayed. So I was wondering if I could respectfully request that we can continue the board meeting and when she arrives we can have a presentation because she is driving up from Reading. Okay. So if that could be allowed. Uh, um, I have no problem with that. So we'll continue okay. this to later in the meeting and just kind of give me a wink and a nod when you're ready. Yes. Thank you very All much. Right. All right. We'll move on to the consent calendar. These items are uh, include routine non-controversial matters and will be acted upon by the board. Um, Roll call motion. A member of the board, staff, or public may request item be pulled and considered separately. Terry, do you have any? Okay. Does staff have anything that wants to be pulled? Yes. Two point three zero. Two point three zero. Yes. Okay. Public. Uh, two point one two. Supervisor Morris? Yes. Supervisor Finley? Yes. Supervisor Mines? Yes. Supervisor Rose? Hi. All right, we'll move on to the pulled items 2.30. And that is approve a budget adjustment for uh, FY. 1718 uh, in the general fund department <coughs> increasing revenues by thirty dollars and approve the budget Excuse me. Right. It's actually 2.30 2.30 you want to take the other item first yes we'll go ahead thank you okay then, then we'll go in order at 2.12. Accept the certification of the canvas of the June 5th, uh, 2018 statewide direct primary election completed on June 22nd, 18, and direct the clerk to let the record show that the official statement of votes cast hereby is made part of the minutes of the board, and the following candidates hereby declared elected to the office specified. For Supervisors District 1, Keith Groves, Superintendent of Schools, Sarah Sapotman, uh, Auditor, Controller, Angie Bickle, uh, Clerk, Recorder, Assessor, Shanna White, District Attorney, Eric Herford, Treasurer, Tax Collector, Terry McGuire. Uh There will be a runoff on the uh, November 6, 18 for the following positions and candidate, candidates. Board of Supervisor, District 4, Jeremy Brown and Justin Sullivan, Sheriff Coroner, Timothy Saxon and Ronald Hanover. No fiscal impact. Okay, you hold, so what's the question? Yeah, Kay Graves from Lewiston. Um, I have a couple, I have many issues with this, of course. Uh, one of them is the, what you have posted for in your backup material. Uh, you have that you contact Julie Barcelona, which I guess is fine since she's the assistant, but you don't, you have, accept the certification of the canvas for the June 5th statewide election, but yet you don't even have that in your backup material. Uh, if you were to read that, it states, um, and I have a copy of it here, I, Shanna White, uh, County Clerk Register of Voters of said county, do cer hereby certify that and pursuant to the provisions of election code, blah, 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 I did canvas the results of the votes cast in the statewide direct primary election. Um, your appointed clerk assessor recorder recused herself at least verbally at one of these meetings. So how can she certify a canvas that she recused herself from? Also, it's signed at the bottom by somebody for Shannon White. There probably should be a name on that. Also, there are problems with this. Um, there's problems with what was written in your backup material. Um, alternatives include financial implications. 
it, or yeah, including financial. The board shall could decline the certification of a canvas. Hey, However, can I, huh? Can I just back you up? Sure. Start and the backup again. What? The, the when, you, when you first go to the backup material, when you go to look up and at the bottom you have attachments. Okay. So it's when you first click to the next screen. Uh, down towards the bottom, it reads that the board could decline the certification of the canvas. However, state law requires that it be reported to the governing board. It wasn't in November. So is that true? If it's true, then there should have been something done about that in November. Also, it says the recommendation, the state law requires that the certification of the canvas be reported to the governing board and declining it would go against state law. Really? How does that go against state law? So who wrote this? Who gave the board this information? Because I, how can declining the canvas go against state law? You have the choice whether to accept it or not. And if it's required of you, why wasn't it done in November? Um, to, and also, uh, sorry, in the summary, it says there was no discrepancies between the electronic count and the hand-counted ballots, and that's not true. There were several uh, precincts. There was at least two that had problems. There was also problems with uh, the count on one candidate and one proposition. And there were a lot of other issues. The, elect the election observers weren't allowed to observe again. Um, your... Uh, your elections officer uh, tampered with the election. I don't know, did she recuse herself or not? If she recused herself, she can't certify the canvas, and she wasn't involved with it. Uh, she also tampered with the grand jury. She met him in the hallway and had conversations with him. She had him come into her office. She mentioned them in uh, articles in the paper. She tampered with the person she hired to do the actual election canvas. Uh, this whole thing is just a mess again. So this person is still your appointed clerk assessor recorder. And this is still under your purview, and you guys are about to um, approve something that I don't think you've actually looked into. And if you guys would have at least acknowledged when we tried to get you guys to take a proactive stance on this election, you would have more information beforehand. So I'm just saying that you probably should know what you're accepting before you do. Thank you. Another question. This is, I'm Julie Barcelona, the assistant clerk reporter assessor. Would you like to respond to anything? Um, Daryl Forslin is the signature on the certification. I can verify that he signed in because he was appointed when Shannon White recused herself. And any of the um, any of the there were no discrepancies. Um, those were resolved during the campus. That were ballots that were misfiled. Okay, so the, the canvassing that, or not the canvassing, the certification letter that says I, Shanna White, is signed by? Is signed by Daryl Forsler, who was the appointed election official for that election. Okay. All right, any other public comment? Back to us. John, you have a question? Uh, no, I don't. Uh, if, you're ready for a motion. if there's no further questions, yes. Okay, I'd like to make a motion regarding 2.12 to accept the certification of the campus of June 5th, 2018, as presented. Second. All right. Supervisor Morris? Yes. Supervisor Finley? Yes. Supervisor Mines? Aye. Supervisor Phillips? Aye. Adopt a resolution which approves memorandum of understanding with the California Department of Justice and award $260,000 in 
$260 and $80 from Proposition 56 Tobacco funds the Trinity County Probation Department to fund a school resource intervention, intervention prevention officer at the Trinity County Schools. Reduction uh, revenue in the amount of $260,000 over the next two fiscal years from Prop 56 Tobacco tax funds. Yeah. Good morning, Chairman Groves, fellow board members. Uh, we noticed an error on the uh, memorandum of understanding with the California Department of Justice. It should read, uh, instead of the Trinity Alps Unified School District, should read the uh, State of California Department of Justice. So I've got 10 uh, new copies that I'd like okay. to several different uh, demo user agreements going on at the same time, so it was an error. Um, okay, any questions from the board on this? Thank you. Any questions from the public on this? All right, we come back. Uh, I'd like to make a motion to approve 2.30, uh, removing a uh, uh, Trinity Up School District and replacing it with the uh, Southern California Department of Justice and uh, Memorandum of Understanding. Second. Supervisor Morris? Yes. Supervisor Finley? Yes. Supervisor Mines? Yes. Supervisor Groves? Aye. Okay, uh, I have a question for David. David, uh, I forgot to recuse myself off of one of the items. Uh, 2.11. So um, I of course would like to recuse out off of that. How do I do that at this point? Um, the board to reconsider at this point. Yes. I'd, I'd like to make a motion to reconsider. Wait, do I? Wait. Okay. You should be out. But do I need to make a motion to reconsider the entire consent or just uh, pulling to the board? Two one one. I'm choosing to recuse. I'd like to make a motion to reconsider two dot one one. All right. The vice chair. Uh, two one one reads: Find that the proposed license will meet the public convenience, necessity, and find no objection to the issuance of an off-sale beer and wine alcohol, alcoholic beverage license to Lakeview Terrace Partners LLC in Lewiston, California, no fiscal impact. Any comments from the public on this item? No. Did I hear a second? Yeah. yeah, I have a second. For the reconsideration? Okay. Reconsideration. Uh, well, I'm Ryan Snelly. I'm the managing member of the Lakeview Terrace Partners LLC. And just wanted to kind of say hello to you guys and tell you, you know, what we're trying to do over there. Uh, the property was purchased in March 1st, and we are, uh, uh, facility for lodging and RVs in the Lewiston area and the area uh, the property is fairly remote as far as getting to any kind of stores or you know markets anything like that um, it's been very well received by the guests and the residents of the area we do have 16 uh, cabins that we rent out we have 30 um, RV spaces and we have six uh, mobile home for permanent residents. Um, from the, the posting, it's been very well received by everybody that's been by. Uh, very happy that they don't have to travel out. I think the closest store to there is about 10, 15 minutes away over in town. So um, it is a place where people go for vacation, uh, fishermen, family reunions, things like that. And oftentimes they will consume beer and wine um, on the premises. So. Uh, as far as the convenience and necessity, I would think safety is a big part. I'd hate to see somebody drinking uh, a few beers and then decide to go out to you know either the store uh, 10 to 15 minutes away or all the way to Weaverville um, you know after they had been drinking. Of course, it'd be the, the worst case scenario. So I think it does provide uh, a convenience certainly to the guests that are there. Uh, it provides more income to the area by providing you know the ease of. Uh, being able to get beer, wine, other small items at the, the store as opposed to having to go out uh, far to get that. So if there's any other questions, I think we're happy to answer. No, I think that's all. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Yeah, great. Welcome. Thanks for investing in the county. Thanks. Thanks. Any other m members of the public comment on this item? Okay. Board members' questions? No. Nope. Okay. Looking for a motion. I am. Make a motion to approve 2.11 as presented. I second. Okay. Uh, Tina, do you have to do a roll call on this? No. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, we're going to come back to the uh, presentations. Uh, item 1.3, receive a presentation from Wendy West, Executive Director of the Northern Region Partnership Health Plan of California regarding partnership health plans serving Trinity County and fiscal impact. Thank you, Board. I appreciate your uh, patience and understanding. Uh, I'd like to introduce to you Wendy West. She is the Executive Director for our Northern Region of Partnership. Um, I can definitely uh, give a testimony that they are an excellent management system for our Medi-Cal population and for our county. They have helped us in so many of our programs. Um, it's an honor to have them here, and uh, thank you, Wendy, and you're all, you're all, it's all on you. <laughs> I want to sincerely apologize for being late today. We've, um, I've been on the Board of Supervisor Roadshow, if you will, and um, visited Siskiyou County last week, and I think, unfortunately, our times were confused. So I was cruising up, beautiful, thinking I'm early, and I get the phone call. I was like, ah, so I, I sincerely apologize. At any rate, I want to also just thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to share a little bit about um, Partnership Health Plan and um, what we're doing here in the community. Um, you might recall that in the fall of 2013, Partnership assumed the responsibility of administering um, Medi-Cal for um, the the members here in Trinity County and um, since then we've actually had some pretty good successes um, most of what I what I'm going to present will if we don't need this it's fine if we don't get it it's fine um, <clears throat> just uh, just a little bit about us there we go there we go perfect okay um, we are a nonprofit public agency and we're designed to um, deliver and um, uh, administer Medi-Cal in a more efficient, cost-effective, um, healthier way, I guess you could say, for our counties. Um, and the way that we do that is that each one of our members are assigned a primary care provider, and we also provide um, a number of services that generally and historically Medi-Cal members weren't uh, necessarily able to receive. Um, number one, if you have any experience with um, Medi-Cal, you understand that sometimes just being covered is only the first hurdle. Um, being able to find a physician or a provider to take that um, insurance is usually the biggest hurdle. And so one of the things that we pride ourselves on, like I said, is um, assigning each one of our members a primary care provider and then also doing everything within our power to ensure that those members get to those providers on a regular basis. And I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the methods that we use to do that. Um, that enable us to uh, keep our members um, healthier, which obviously reduces cost as well as using um, the most appropriate level of care, for example, a doctor's office visit versus an emergency room. So another uh, advantage to this model, of course, is keeping members out of the emergency room for non-emergent type visits. <clears throat> um, we are led and, admin and um, governed by a board of commissioners that's made up of 31 individuals that um, come from our 14 different counties. We're very um, happy and, and uh, lucky to have Letty Garza here representing Trinity County. And um, just, so, just to give you an idea of uh, the, the impact that we can have and, and the, the, 
the, uh, the number of members that we have. We are covering um, just over 560,000 members in our 14 counties. And in Trinity County alone, with your 40, about 43,000, I think it is your population, we have over 4,300 members here. Is that wrong? 14. 14, I apologize. That's okay. I, I'm like, that seems high. <laughs> I think I got my 40 here. But we have 4,300 members here. So you can see that it's a very large percentage of your population. It's sticky. So I'm going to go ahead. Oh, there we go. As you can see, um, our footprint is pretty much the entire Northern California, Upper Northern California. Um, we cover 14 different counties, um, like I said, and the largest geographical area is what we refer to as the Northern region, which are the seven northernmost counties. Um, however, the southern seven, this, uh, southernmost counties have about two-thirds of our membership. So we um, obviously you can you probably understand that we encounter some very unique challenges here in the north, um, being very rural and having um, kind of a shortage of providers and that sort of thing. So that's something that we really really try to make sure that we um, address for our members. Um, one of the one of the uh, proudest things I think I can say as being part of this organization is that we are able to administer Medi-Cal for 14 counties for um, about an average of a 4% administrative cost, which is four to five times less than what was costing the state when it was fee-for-service. Um, and so obviously that is enables us to have at times, sometimes even a um, surplus of funds. And one of the, uh, the big advantages to having a managed care plan is the fact that whatever we are able to save, if you will, we're also able to reinvest those funds in the community. Went too far then, didn't I? Um, most recently, you may have um, heard that we were uh, uh, granting housing grants in our 14 counties. Um, we uh, actually granted a total of $25 million throughout our 14 counties based on the membership and the number of members in each county and Trinity County um, was granted a $195,000 grant from partnership um, in collaboration with the county um, to work on housing issues. Some um, individuals have asked me, you know, previously, well, why, if you're Medi-Cal and, and you're healthcare, why are you involved in housing? And um, I think it's it's actually a pretty simple answer. If you if you have no home, it's pretty hard to stay healthy. It's also tough for us if you land in the emergency room or the or the hospital for us to get you out of the hospital in a healthy way. And so, um, housing is something that we have really focused on in the last couple of years. One of the other ways that we um, incentivize, if you will, our providers to ensure that they are seeing our members and providing the most um, uh, quality, high quality care possible is we do quality incentive programs for our providers, for our specialists, our hospitals, and our primary care providers. So we set goals and guidelines based on number of visits, um, appropriate levels of care, lengths of stays, um, children getting their immunizations on time, women getting their mammograms on time, um, and when the providers meet or exceed those guidelines, they're able to receive um, quality incentive program money back. And in Trinity County alone in 2017, we were able to um, pay out $344,000 in those programs. So again, that's all a result of the effectiveness of the, the program and the savings. <clears throat> In 2017, um, we also were able to, what I call, be uh, boots on the ground in the community. Um, one of the very big advantages to having um, partnership health plan or a, a local managed care plan is that we are local. Um, we have, as I showed earlier, an office in Reading with um, nearly 200 employees, and we have individuals that are assigned primarily just to Trinity County. Um, we also have another office in Eureka, 
Um, so I guess you are surrounded. <laughs> um, but at any rate, we um, pride ourselves on being visible to our providers and our members. We did 43 individual provider visits. Those are in person. That doesn't even take into account the um, hundreds of phone calls and that sort of thing. We have individuals in Reading, um, a fully staffed member services call center, so they're able to pick up the phone and get help. Um, and our provider call center is fully staffed Monday through Friday as well. And I'm proud to say that we um, average a 17 second call of wait time. So pretty impressed with that. Um, one of the other, uh, the ways that we have reinvested in our community is through our provider recruitment program. And we have partnered with the providers um, in our individual counties to um, assist with searches and recruitment for physicians, um, mid-level providers, um, and um, you know, nurse practitioners, medical assistants. And in 2017, through um, grants that we partnered with the providers um, for sign-on bonuses, relocation, et cetera, we were able to help recruit five new providers in Trinity County in 2017. In addition to um, the reinvestment of funds, we also are very active in um, the quality of our members um, and the quality of care. Um, through our drug formulary programs and our count complex, complex case coordination and care coordination, we have um, seen a 94% decrease in the unsafe um, uh, dosages of opioids and one thing that's not on my um, presentation but I wanted to share is we've also seen a 36% decrease in non-emergent emergency room visits for Trinity County which is a big impact this is a little bit of um, a little snapshot of the demographics um, you can see the age ranges um, the ethnicity and our languages for Trinity County um, just a reminder some some um, may ask you know why do we have a a significant amount of people with uh, uh, Medi-Cal over 65 and remember that we do cover a large percentage of people that have Medicare as their primary insurance and Medi-Cal as their secondary insurance. Right now we have one specialty, specialty um, a specialist in the county, three PCPs, and five non-physician mid-level providers. And again, as I said earlier, we um, are proud of having made 43 individual visits in the community. I want to do um, a big thank you to Letty for all of her support. Um, and guidance. Um, one of the things that we pride ourselves on is making sure that we customize and individualize the services and the provide and the and you know the, just everything that we provide for the county. And Letty and her team have been instrumental in making sure that we keep focus on those things that are most important to your county. Okay. I just wanted to see if you had any questions. So, does this? You also cover dental care for this? We don't. Oh, don't. But we okay. do care. What we cover um, is for children. We will cover um, the anesthesia if they need anesthesia. But dental is not covered. It's it's a carved out service. Okay. Thank you. All right. Letty, do you want to? <laughs> Thank you very much, Wendy. I do want to make sure uh, the board um, understands also, partnership has been such a huge support not only to public health but to behavioral health. Um, we're working very closely with them in our opioid coalition. We have some campaigns scheduled that without their support and, and financial support, uh, they allowed us to get some grant funds through Aegis. And um, again, like she said, it, in comparison to how Medi-Cal was managed by the state, compared to managed care through partnership, it is black and white. We've never had so much engagement in focusing on all, all the issues that we are trying to improve. You know, unfortunately, our, our health rating in Trinity County was rated very, very low. Um, so that's something that we're really focusing on in trying to bring more awareness, education, and we couldn't do it without partnerships. So I just really want to make sure you understand that, and we're just very, you know, uh, lucky to have that relationship and partnership. <laughs> so thank you very much. That's all I have. Does anyone have any questions? Okay. Thank you.
Yes, yes. Yeah. supervisor Morris. Okay. That's a okay. new okay. system for us. Where? So, so. Uh, Andy, Andy. I mean, either one of you maybe can answer this question. Does IGT funds yes. flow through yes. partnership? And uh, remind me again, where's, what's the status of those funds? Well, those funds were used to help support our probation department, our behavioral health, mm -hmm. um, for a lot of those education and outreach efforts that all of our departments are working on with them. So again, that was the initial start of our relationship with them, which they, boy, I, I can't even think about the money right now, how much it is, but it's been substantial. Um, so we're still using that money to still you know, improve our engagement and uh, outreach. So yes, IGT, the intergovernmental transfer, in case you, you don't remember what that is, that's what that, yes. Is that an ongoing thing or did we just get a lump sum of money? We've remember. received a lump sum the last several several years. You know, it's my understanding it is supposed to sunset in the future. We just don't know when yet. It's still, I know it is still in place for 1718. It's just, it's tough to gauge how it will go because we're always working so retrospectively in that program. I think we just finished off 1617, yes, to be honest right. with you. So right. we're always it's behind. It's the state. It's always behind. Um, so I know that it will still be in place for 1718. Um, and then I just wanted to mention you, or I'd probably remiss not to mention, um, because we are also, it, aside from just investing in the community, we also, because um, you mentioned dental, although we unfortunately don't cover dental, there are numerous uh, services that we do provide that normally would not be provided. Because as a managed care provider for Medi-Cal, we're, we're required to, um, you know, supply a minimum, but we go much higher than that. We provide a number of um, optional services that we're able to do because we are more efficient with the other funds. Mm -hmm. so, even acupuncture. Yeah. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you again, and I apologize for being late. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Okay, on to uh, reports. Uh, any reports from department heads? I see Letty running, so. <laughs> <laughs> yes, no. No, O'Neill from Behavioral Health. Um, I wanted to let the, the board know that this past week I was in Sacramento uh, with a meeting for our association, the County Behavioral Health Directors. <laughs> and. Um, the CEO of our organization resigned in the beginning of July, and we wanted to hear from some of the stakeholders across um, different disciplines. And so um, Diane Cummings, who's the right-hand person to the governor in terms of budget, um, the Steinberg Institute was present, uh, Frank Mecca, who is the, um, the California um, Welfare Directors Association. He's kind of seen as the perfect CEO because he does such a good job. Toby Ewing, who's over the uh, Oversight and Accountability Commission, came and CSAC was there, Graham. They all were very supportive about the seeking of a new association director. All five of them mentioned the theme of the great opportunities that are now present to reshape how behavioral health does business. And I think that was the message that I heard, my takeaway was that uh, we have to do a lot better than what we have been doing. We need better integration uh, with all of the organizations that we serve. And um, that recruitment is going on right now and uh, we'll see what happens. That kind of parallels where I'm at personally in my career that uh, I have announced my retirement to uh, our human resources and to, and to our CAO, uh, effective um, November 16th. So I'm certainly hoping that that will give our human resources four months to be able to recruit and find a director. The reason I made this decision was that I believe Trinity County, because of so much going on in the world of behavioral health and so many new initiatives and compliance concerns coming down from the state, um, we really need a full-time director. I'm less than half-time. And, you know, with um, the leaving of Anne Ligorio, who was an assistant director, and our choice not to fill that for right now because of our finances, um, it's critical that we have someone who's really 
um, at the helm every day. And, uh, you know, my wife will tell me I'm a full-time employee, but I'm not. I'm 41 percent. Um, I do want to mention that uh, I've served as behavioral health director for more than nine and a half years. I'm, I'm one day longer than a Supervisor Morris. I started January 5th, 2009, and she was sworn in on January 6th of 2009. So we've kind of been in this, uh, this together. I also want to just mention that um, this board has been incredibly supportive. Everything the behavioral health has asked for, um, you have been able to allow us to do, and I believe that that's the reason why we've had good success uh, for our community and uh, community wellness around behavioral health issues. And um, I just can't be thankful enough to county administration, to human resources, the auditor, uh, for, for all of the, of the uh, support that they've given. And I think as you look for your new behavioral health director, it, it's going to be just critical that uh, you find someone who really wants to integrate. Uh, as just we heard from Partnership Health, um, if a person has physical health concerns and they have co-occurring mental health or substance use issues and those issues aren't being coordinated and cared for simultaneously, um, it's going to be far more costly and it's not going to be very effective. We have key partners, Behavioral Health does, um, certainly the, the emergency room for 5150s, the sheriff for welfare checks for uh, the 5150s, Health and Human Services, we work so closely with them. Public Guardian resides there. The foster care system for which all of those children desperately need intervention. And, and it's our job. The schools, um, and I've had an uh, opportunity to work with Supervisor Minds around uh, improving response to the high school. And it was partly through his initiative that we've really introduced some new programs to serve the, um, the youth at the high school. So thank you, Supervisor. Um, the probation department, AB 109, we just, um, we have to work together and um, our nonprofit HRN, especially with housing concerns. And there are great opportunities in the housing realm. And so I'm hoping that as um, you work with, and in statute there is a requirement that the replacement of the behavioral health director um, be um, synchronized with the behavioral health advisory board. They have to be involved in that selection. And I'm just hoping that the vision for the, the new director is um, going to serve the total needs of the county. So. Um, Myself, uh, I intend to continue serving on the California Mental Health, uh, Behavioral Health Planning Council. Uh, again, with so much uh, at stake uh, for behavioral health, this is a great opportunity to advise the legislature about um, practices that are, are actually effective. And uh, I will continue serving on the Mendocino County Behavioral Health, uh, Mendocino County Juvenile Justice Commission. And, Yes, I will be tending to my apple farm. Not marijuana farm, apple farm. So, thank you so much. Well, thank you for your service. Levy Garza, Health and Human Services. Um, I just wanted to report to the board that, you know, since we're definitely in fire season, uh, I just want to let the board know that between our Office of Emergency Services, we've been pretty active, and I'm sure you've seen emails, you've seen flyers, you've been really promoting the Code Red system to the county. Um, we're really encouraging everybody to sign up for Code Red. Uh, we're still getting information on the 211 system. You know, we're one of the 14 counties that do not have it, so we're, we're hoping we can get that in place, and it will be in the focus of emergency 211. It's not the, the general 211, so I will be bringing more information on that to you. Because I think the community would appreciate having a system that they can call to get information on whether there's shelters open, donation centers, that type of thing during a disaster. So I'll be bringing that information to you. Um, 
I do want to let the board know also we've been having some great disaster council meetings and I appreciate Supervisor Groves participating in that and Supervisor Morris. Um, we have uh, quite a few county staff trained on how to work the Emergency Operations Center. I really want to thank the department heads that have allowed their staff to participate in that training because um, Ed would have like specific uh, like a mock training if we did have an incident in each function of the EOC, how what their role would, would do and what, what it means. Um, so I'm really proud that we've been able to establish that. So we're pretty much ready to go, um, although we pray there's no fires this year, but just want to make sure the board's assured that we are it's on our focus and we want to be prepared and want the community to be prepared as well. So I just wanted to let you know what, what, what we've been up to. So that's all I have right now. Since the uh, traffic signal was a uh, thing of discussion last week in the paper, I just wanted to give the board an update that uh, we did finish the review with Caltrans and they've authorized us to order the polls. Again, polls, uh, as I mentioned earlier, are very long lead time, 16 to 20 weeks, uh, particularly for decorative features to match the polls that we have in town here. And so um, it, it is with the contractor uh, getting a, a Pre-bid price, and we should. I'm hoping to either bring it uh, first meeting in August, second meeting in August. But we're looking for construction in the, uh, uh, just after Christmas. What what phase? How many <laughs> phases did they agree on in the end? They require full control okay. all the way around. So there'll be protected left turns for the side streets. All right, um, with, with that, um, we're going to do uh, county CAO. Nothing to report in this section, but I'll report out as we get to the other sections that, uh, regarding the jail and the refinance and budget. Okay. Uh, reports from supervisors, Mr. Mines. A lot of county travel. Yep. No amount of county travel for me, also. Okay, um, ad hocs, anything going on in the state legislation we need to know about? Okay. Yes. Um, okay. Still again on banking, um, CSAC took a resolution to NACO um, to uh, kind of increase the conversation with the federal government to allow states to operate those with those who have medical and recreational cannabis programs. So I, it is my understanding it passed the various committees at NACO and that is the start of a, of a long conversation with the feds that CSAC and our working group uh, something that was important to them because it also ties back into also some banking issues that every state's going to uh, is dealing with. So. Okay. The um, Canvas Commercial Ordinance. We have anything to report? Uh, of course, we have two items coming up later on the agenda. Um, we will are still sending a variety of things to um, the PC. There's been a little bit of a break for a variety of reasons, and um, I think that's it. That's something I'm looking at. Just the, for the next thing that goes to the PC will uh, be the updated um, cultivation ordinance that we've been talking about for a while. We don't have a date, though. We don't have a date. All right, new jail facility. Yeah, thank you, uh, Chairman Groves. We're in the process of uh, fine-tuning the RFQ, and if all goes well, it'll be uh, put out to the public on July 25th. And uh, record back to the county on August 25th and then we'll, you know, the bids take it up at a board meeting, I believe that's where we'll do it. But, um, so we move forward and we're with our few points as part of that. Quick question. Can you repeat those dates again, Richard? Get those out to the big July 25th. July 25th and back on August 25th. Okay, thank you. So they're not set in stone yet because we're still, but those are the dates we have. 
Okay, has COP refinancing? Yeah, it is still in the bond council at this point. Okay. What we carry yesterday, it just is in the bond council. All right. Budget development? And again, if all goes well, uh, we'll, we'll complete, we'll wrap it up today and we'll send the budgets out to uh, the department heads hopefully uh, tomorrow and they'll be able to review them and, and uh, respond to uh, what the budget committee is, is uh, determined. And wilderness oversight, nothing new from my side, John. Nope. Okay. And I do want to um, go back on the commercial cannabis ordinance. The closing for the RFP for our environmental work will be this week, so we'll, we'll get that working. All right, so with that, we're going to take a 10 minute break. Back at 10 36, please.